Dream to become the next Sir Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein? Learn from the master, Refath Bari. Watch his videos to achieve your dream. Yeah. All right, folks, welcome to the 16th lecture in special relativity. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a very complex problem that deals with Gauss's law of electric fields. This problem is going to involve spherical coordinates, Gauss's first law, as I mentioned, and Maxwell's first law, right? So uh, make sure that you're okay with all of those topics before proceeding on to today's lecture. If you're not, you can go ahead and explore them in the previous lectures. Let's go ahead and get started with today's lecture. As you can see, we're dealing with special relativity, lecture number 16, Maxwell and spherical coordinates. Okay, hopefully this serves as a good example for Maxwell's first law. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so today we basically have a lesson only. So here's the problem. <clears throat> the problem is that you're on the three-dimensional plane, right, x, y, z, and you have a sphere. And hopefully you all know what a sphere looks like. It looks basically like a three-dimensional circle. So let me draw for you what a sphere looks like. So we're going to have a sphere, something much like that, right? That's a sphere. And of course my sphere is going to have to be realistic, something like that, right? That hopefully you're convinced that that looks like a sphere. Now, in the center of my sphere, I'm going to have a charge, okay? So I'm going to represent that charge using the orange marker. So here I'm going to have some kind of a charge and I'll shade it in orange. And let's call this charge Q. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. If not, I'll zoom in into whatever I'm writing. So go ahead and make sure you can see what I'm writing over there. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All I had to do, all I did so far at least, is just draw a sphere and say that it has some charge, uh, Q, at its center. Okay, so hopefully all of that makes sense thus far. Now, all of this is fine and dandy, but since we have a charge Q, I'm obviously going to have an electric field, right? Because charges create electric fields. So I'm going to denote that electric field using my orange marker. So this electric field is going to emanate outwards, radially outwards. Because it's going to be some kind of a positive charge, the electric field is going to radiate outwards, something like that. Okay, so that right there is the electric field for this charge. And it emanates radially outwards in all directions. So hopefully everyone can see what I've just drawn right here. Okay, let me go to the other side and make sure that you understand what I just did. Is just draw a sphere, say that it has some charge Q at the center, and that charge is emanating electric field lines radially outward. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, now... My goal is to find the electric flux of this electric field uh, out of a certain section of my sphere. So let me show you what I mean. Let's take, a, let's take some kind of a slice of the sphere, something like this. Oops. Let's take a, a slice of our sphere. So, boom. Boom. So that right there is some kind of a three-dimensional slice of our sphere. And of course that slice will have its own surface area that I'm shading in cyan right now just so that you can see it more clearly and my goal is to find the flux of this electric field that's created by the charge Q out of this cyan surface okay so hopefully everyone sees what I've, what I've drawn right there okay so hopefully that's not too bad my goal is to find the electric flux coming out of that cyan that, that blue region and uh, I'm going to obviously use Gauss's first law of electric fields. So um, go ahead, try to consider the problem for a few seconds, and I'll give you a few seconds to try out the problem. Hopefully that was enough time to consider the problem. Now we're actually going to go ahead and solve it. So let me erase what I've drawn here, and we're going to actually just solve, or at least just create the diagram for this problem today. 
In the next lecture, I'll go ahead and start the integral process. Okay, let's formally begin this problem by actually drawing the diagram on the x, y, z plane. So say bye bye to this uh, to this region. Okay, so let's start with our regular good old x, y, z plane, shall we? So x, y, z plane is going to look something like this, right? So we're going to have my uh, z axis, my y axis, and finally my x axis, right? Now I have to draw my, my surface of interest, right? And that surface is going to be uh, some section of the sphere. So something that will probably look like that. Right? And of course you can connect these two. I should say you should connect these two and connect all of that with the center. Yikes. Okay? So that right there is my surface of interest. Maybe I should just uh, erase this so it just does indeed look three dimensional. So you should imagine this as the surface of some kind of a sphere. Okay? Now, my chart is going to be at the origin, right? So you can just keep that in your mind. My goal right now is to find the area of, uh, of a small piece of this surface so that I can integrate over it when it comes to Gauss's law of electric fields. Okay? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, take, let's go ahead and find uh, the area of a very small piece of my surface so that later on when it comes to taking the integral, I can integrate in respect to that very small differential surface, as I like to call it. Okay, first things first, I gotta introduce some variables, some angles, some side lengths, and to do so, uh, I think I lost my orange marker already, but huzzah, I have it. So the first angle I'm gonna introduce is phi. And that's gonna be this angle in respect to the horizontal. That's gonna be phi right over there. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, and after phi, this small, this small, uh, additional angle from the horizontal will be d phi, a small differential of phi, right? A very small increase in the angle from the horizontal. Let me make sure that everyone out there can actually see what I'm drawing right now. Yep, okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is take a very small slice, a very small slice of my, of my, of my surface right here, and that slice will be right here. Right? So just take a random slice, I kind of chop it off, right? And, uh, okay, well, how do we find the area of that slice? That's our goal, right? We have to find the area of this kind of a maroon slice. So let me go ahead and write that down. Goal, this is our goal. Let me write it on the left-hand side. So that always, that's always at the back of your mind when you're solving this. Goal is find area of of this kind of small differential piece, right? This kind of a three-dimensional curvy-looking uh, ridge, a uh, rigid three-dimensional piece, right? Uh, I'll denote it as ds for differential surface. Okay, so that's our goal to find the area of that of that piece. Okay, so first and foremost, what am I going to do to achieve that goal? Well, I'm going to take the vertices of this piece and connect it with the with the with the origin which is the center of my sphere. Okay? And uh, yeah, that's, I think that should, uh, that, should do, that should do pretty well, and maybe I'll do another one. Okay? And then of course I can project the, these other two vertices onto the z, z axis. Okay, so something like that. Something like that. So hopefully everyone has a has a good idea of what we're dealing with here. Our goal is, of course, to find the area of this differential surface. And we've already done two things to that end, which is project the vertices of this differential surface onto the z-axis and connect it with the origin. Okay, uh, these are all hopefully natural steps to you by now. Steps that even you would take if you were given this problem. Okay, so. Now what are we going to do? Well, our goal is just to find the area of this small differential su uh, surface, right? This small differential piece. So first things first is I'm going to write down what I know. And I know that this uh, sphere is going to have a constant radius of r. Of r. 
And if that's a radius r, and I denote this as an angle theta, right? And let's say that this is some additional angle d theta, or delta theta, then what is this length going to be? Let me show you what I'm talking about. What is this green length over here going to be? In terms of my radius and my angle, what is this green length over here going to be? Well, let's go ahead and find out. Let me call this green length x, or you know, x is already taken. Let's call it, um, what do you want to call it? Let's call it k, okay? Let's call that green, green line k. And so the length of k is going to be given by 1. Well, it's going to be given by sine of this angle, because remember, this is a projection, so the angle it makes with the z-axis is going to be 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Okay, hopefully that, that even looks clear. It doesn't even look clear to me. Okay? So we can just go ahead and write down sine of that angle theta. Sine of theta is going to be opposite, and opposite is what? Opposite is the length we're interested in k divided by hypotenuse, and of course our hypotenuse is the radius of the sphere. So that means the length of k, the length of k is simply going to be what? r sine theta, right? So k is going to equal r sine theta. r sine theta. And I'm color coding everything just so that you can hopefully see what's going on in the picture, in the diagram rather. Okay? So hopefully all of that is visible, all of that makes sense. Now what are we going to do? We know that k is r sine theta. No need to write k anymore. We can just replace that with good old r sine theta. R sine theta. So let me go ahead and write that down. r sine theta. Now what are we going to do is... Huh. What else can we do to find the area of this, of this surface? I don't think that helps very much. Um, well, if we know that this is r and this is d theta, then we can approximate this, this little segment over here, right? This little r line. Why? Well, remember that if you have some kind of a, a circle and you have an angle theta and a radius r, then the arc length of this arc length, this little piece over here, is going to be what? It's going to be theta over 2 pi times the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. So that means that little region, that the little arc length is going to be given by r theta, right? S is equal to r theta. And that's not an approximation, that's literally exact, right? So if we want this arc length here, we're just going to do apply the same principle, right? So instead of s equals r theta, I'm going to do s is equal to r d theta. So let me, uh, I'm already running out of space, so hopefully you understand why I'm, why I'm taking this problem pretty slowly. So let me zoom in on this surface right here. Let's zoom in on that surface. So I have, I have my kind of R, and then I've got the, the kind of uh, piece of the surface, right? Looks, it looks something like that, right? That's my R, and that's, my, uh, that's a piece of my surface. Okay, so this is going to be r, that's going to be theta, and thus by the arc angle formula, I know that this is going to be, sorry, this is going to be d theta, so then I know this is going to be r d theta, that length, right? So I'm basically halfway through finding the area of this, of this tiny uh, differential surface. I already know one length is r d theta, I just need the other length, right? How are we going to find the other length? Well, First and foremost, let me write down the length we just found, r d theta, that right there, that length. How are we going to find the second length of my differential surface? Hmm. Is there some uh, trick, some some magic up my sleeve? Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of. But check out what we can do. Look at uh, check out what we can do. Look at this. We know that this is also the radius of the sphere, right? So we can call that r. So this is r, and this is d uh, d phi. What is this? Well, what is this going to be? 
Well, it's going to be pretty simple. As a matter of fact, this doesn't, let's just call it f for now, shall we? Let's call it f. And if this is f and this is d phi, well, by the same principle of the arc length, I know that this arc over here is going to be what? This arc over here is going to be f d phi. f d phi, right? By the way, I said that this doesn't necessarily have to be the radius because this isn't part of the sphere, right? Okay, so that's f and that's d phi, and by the arc length principle, I get that this is f d phi. But what's f? Uh, actually, let me make sure that the audience can see that I just wrote f d d phi over there. And thankfully, I checked, otherwise uh, they couldn't see that. So hopefully now you can see what I just wrote, which is f d phi. Okay? Let me explain once again, which is that I took the arc length principle and applied it over here because this length is f and this angle is d phi, meaning that this arc length is f d phi. Okay. So now what can we do? We can just find the we can just find what f is. And if you know the formula for spherical coordinates, you would know that f is r sine theta. Why? Why is that? Well, let me show you. Let me show you why. Um, First of all, this is our sine theta, but that's not, that's not how I like to approach it. What I do typically is once again draw the xyz axis, and let me show you why that has to be our sine theta. If I had some kind of a plane on the xyz axis, I really gotta switch up my colors. If I had some kind of a plane in the xyz axis, something like this, maybe not the best plane ever, but you get the picture. And the distance from the origin to one of the vertices, to the opposite vertex of this plane, let's call that distance r, shall we? Let's call that distance r. This distance over here, let's call it r. Now, from my diagram itself, I can see that we have what? We have, we have, uh, we have this angle as being theta. This angle right here is going to be our theta. So if that's theta, what do I know? What do I know is that this is also theta. By the law of internal angles, interior angles, these two have to be congruent. They both have to be theta. So if this is theta, then what do I know about this, this segment on the bottom, this, uh, this kind of line segment on the bottom, this, this piece of my plane? What, what's this length going to be? Equivalent to this length f over here, what's that length going to be? Well, you can just use basic trigonometry, right? Once again, we have sine of theta, Sine is basically helping us all the way now. This is our f. So sine of theta is going to equal opposite, which is f, over hypotenuse, which is r. So that means my uh, line segment f is simply going to be r sine theta, right? r sine theta. So take a moment to digest that. I just said that this f is going to be r sine theta. So I can just replace this f over here with r sine theta. So let's go ahead and replace this f over here, f over here, with r sine theta, okay? Now, what I can do is just go ahead and write that down. For this length of the surface, that's going to be what? r sine theta d phi. And the other length is just going to be r d theta, folks, okay? Now, we finally know the area of our differential surface is what? The area of our differential surface is quite simply going to be the following. But we can, we can approximate it as a rectangle. So, if uh, we can approximate it as a rectangle, then what's the area going to be? We know one side length is going to be r d theta. So let's write that down over here. Uh, actually, I have more space, so why don't I use it? So this, this length over here is going to be r d theta. That's going to be the, the height of my, of my rectangle, and the base is just r sine theta d phi. So the area is just a product, r squared sine theta d theta d phi. Thank you for watching, folks, and we'll see you next time. Subscribe to Bari Science Lab to fall in love with math and science, especially programming.